Hello everyone, welcome to your GAT Qudrat um, lesson. <laughs> I have listened to your requests, and yes, it is true. There are all there. I have I haven't found a single resource on the internet that covers the verbal section of the GAT, and hopefully, I'm here to change that. Now, the verbal section consists of a few parts. You have uh, sentence completion, comprehension, um, you have, of course, analogies, and today we're going to be covering analogies, and also we will be covering other parts in the future, so stay tuned for more, and uh, I will, of course, be back to math. I think, let me, guys, l let me know what you guys think. Should, should we do um, a video, for example, like one video verbal section, one video math section, or what would you guys prefer? Should we finish math section and then start the English section? Let me know what you guys think. But for today, we will be talking about analogies, one of the more difficult parts of the verbal section. Hopefully, you're going to see that it's not that difficult. And we're going to solve some questions later on together. Let's go. So, first of all, let's talk about what is an analogy? What does this word mean? If I tell you right now, like, what is an analogy? You probably know what it is, but... Keeping the definition in mind would help because an analogy is a comparison of two things, for example. It is not a comparison per se, but you take certain aspects from some things and you compare them together. And that becomes your analogy. That is its very basic definition. Now, the GAT exam covers a few types of analogies. It will... I hope so. I mean, in, in my experience with the exams that I've taken, I have never seen analogy questions go outside of this box. So if you know the types of analogies, that's really it. You need to know the definition of the words and the types of analogies. And of course, the way that the exam works. But that's really it. The analogy section, you, you don't need that much. All you need is to know the types, right? You don't even need to memorize them by heart, but keep them in mind. And definitions, of course, uh, this is a very bad D, but let's just ignore it. Definitions, right? And then how the exam works, how the test works, right? Because the test in of itself has some rules. So these, if you have these three things, you will ace this section. Trust me, you do not need to lose any grades, <laughs> any marks on this section. You can definitely ace it. In my experience, the, sometimes the questions are easier than the ones in the book, and sometimes they are harder. I took the test a few times, and one time it, it was actually way harder than the actual book. The other time it was way easier. So hopefully we're going to cover a wide range, and I'll give you a, an example of um, not necessarily each type, but... I'll give you an example of each type, but I will give you 10 questions at the end. We're going to solve them together. Analogy questions, of course. And you guys are going to see what I'm For talking our about. Our first type, we have things that go together. Now, what does that mean? So here are a couple of, of examples. A bat and a ball. If you are from the United States, or if you know what baseball is, you know, it's like a bat and a ball. You always see them together in baseball. And for us Saudis, I guess we can take the example of football, right? You, your, for example, soccer shoes and football and the ball, right? Or the field and the goal or the goal and the goalie. Like these examples, just things that go together or like a shoelace and a shoe or like salt and pepper, bread and butter. Just these things just go together. Now, is there a clear definition? No, because as you can see, bread and butter. For example, what if I'm not some, I'm someone who just doesn't know that these things go together. I don't eat, for example, let's say I don't eat bread and butter and I've never heard um, of people eating bread and butter. So how, how am I supposed to know? Well, my answer to that question, because it is something that I've struggled with, practice. Practice through the exam and just remember these things. Remember that bread and butter go together. Usually the questions repeat. You're not going to get a lot of new questions. You will get new questions, but not that much. And also, 
using common sense some most of the times and I'll show you why using common sense is very much possible. I personally did very well on this section without studying for it using only common sense because they kind of make it easy easy for you to see what they want. So that's just the first things. Things uh, the first I mean type of analogy that you're going to be seeing uh, things that go together. Now, the next type is way more straightforward. Opposites. Big, small, hot, cold, graceful, clumsy. Um, maybe you don't know these words, right? So, graceful. Now, for your entertainment, I'm going to be drawing out those things, hopefully to give you like a better understanding. So, something that is graceful is like, what, angelic, right? <laughs> I'm going to try my best to draw an angel here. All right, I'm actually not going to try my best. So I'm going to just draw a stick person. They have wings, right? Because they're an angel. They float around with grace. That is, you know, what grace is. With, with swiftness, with skill, with delicacy. Now, something that is clumsy is like, a, like let's say, a big person, right? They're not graceful. They're just walking around, crashing things left and right breaking things for example this is a tree right they broke it down they're stupid examples right but that's what it is so you see how this person is very graceful and this person is very clumsy they're breaking down things they're they're clatterful they're just doing a lot of stuff so unorganized all of these things the, this is what graceful and clumsy mean <laughs> hopefully that will give you this this will keep it in your brain but yeah Another word for opposites is antonyms. We have synonyms and antonyms, right? So opposites are antonyms. You're going to be seeing them a lot. And they are very straightforward. Big, small, hot, cold, graceful, clumsy. Um, something that you really, really, really need to keep in your mind in this exam is, uh, for example, if you're given big and small, and then in the, in the choices... For example, you're given, you're given two antonyms, but for example, one of them is, uh, let's, let's, let's see, what, what, what example can we give? Um, let's say, let's say, um, water, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this smaller, yeah, let's say things, things that are opposite, so for example, calm, and angry, right, or delightful, and disgusting, <laughs> and disgusting, yeah, so, um, actually, let's flip that, let's bring this one here, and bring this one here, yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I mean with a second, I, in a second, I promise this is worth it, <laughs> right so <laughs> which one would you choose you're, you're probably thinking well both of them are antonyms but if you're given big and small f you can kind of see that one of them is the extremity and the other is the non-extremity so something that is big opposed to something that is small right so it's not going to be calm and angry this is just something that you really have to use logic and there's no certain way to use it in, in in this example i'm giving you a very hard example if you see this on a test you're probably never going to see this on the test i don't think that's even a good example but what i'm trying to tell you is that you have to match the first at uh, the first uh, object or thing to the second object or thing it's not random you don't choose the first one you see you have to know which which one matches the first one so for example you can say that um graceful let's say graceful and clumsy something that is graceful opposed to something that is cl clumsy you would choose in that case uh, a let's say calm and angry graceful calm angry or like clumsy they go together it makes more sense that you choose this one over this one so yeah this is something that matters uh, it's way easier than what i just explained but just keep that in your mind <laughs> we have synonyms just like antonyms we've got synonyms so things that are opposite of each other and things that are close to each other right so big and large something that is big something that is large when you hide something is the same when I say I concealed something this is 
maybe a more fancy word, conceal. So it's the same as to hide something that is sharp, dull. Yeah, this doesn't fit here. Excuse me. This goes, this goes here, right? Something that is sharp as opposed to something that is dull. Um, I'll give you another example for a synonym because we're missing one. Let's say um, you can, I want to give you an example that is actually good. So let me think about it. Right. So an example of a synonym, which I've thought about is, for example, disgusting. I don't know why I'm using this word a lot. I apologize. Hopefully it'll make you remember things better because this word prompts feeling and things that prompt feeling make you remember. But yeah, so for example, something that is disgusting and something that is vile, vile. You can kind of see this as an extremity of disgusting, but they're basically the same thing. Something that is really disgusting is something that is really vile. So that's a synonym. Things that are basically the same. Or you can switch them. If you want to really figure out if it's a synonym or not, can you switch it? If yeah, then yeah, it's a synonym. Now this gets fun. We get the object and something. This variation. Object and classification, object and group, oh, object and group, object and related object, object as characteristic, location, part of whole, function. So what is that? Let's take each one. Object and group. You can really replace this object with being or creature because a whale is not an object, but let's just ignore that for now. So what is a group of whales? They're actually called a pod. I didn't know this when I first took the exam. I had no idea that a group of whales is a pod, which is why you kind of have to know these things. Um, practice. Practice what you can. If you can really, my advice in this test for the English section, get more familiar with the English language. Watch TV shows and movies and whatever it is, right? Get more familiar with the language. But of course, you don't have that much time. So instead of watching TV shows and movies, do exercises. If you have a year, if you're in grade 10 watching this, go ahead, watch movies, get more familiar with the English language, ask your teacher to help you, they probably have some things. So yeah, a group of whale, a group of whales is a pod, a group of birds is a flock. Most of us know, know this, a group of birds, a flock of birds, a group of lions is a pride. I found this very cool. <laughs> so a group of lions, a bunch of lions, that's a pride. So that's object and group, an object with its group. And then you have object and related object. So what they mean by related object is literal relation. So a butterfly and it's and like a caterpillar, a, cal a caterpillar used to be, a, I mean, a butterfly used to be a caterpillar, right? I think that here they thought it's, so for, you can, you can basically say that a caterpillar is a younger butterfly, right? Same thing with like a puppy and dog. A puppy is a dog is a, uh, oh my god, a puppy is a younger dog and a baby is a younger mother. You can take it that example, but also you can take it as this example, a mother and its baby, a father and child, right? A father and child. But you can also say like a man and child. That's what this section means when, when they say that it's an object and it's related uh, and it's related object. If you well, they're not going to tell you what it is, but they're going to show you this part. You're going to show you, for example, butterfly caterpillar, and they're going to tell you, oh, is it is it? Um, for example, you're going to have the choices: is it dog and puppy that matches this analogy, or is it lion pride that matches this analogy, or is it three and odd number that matches this analogy? Oh wow, I didn't cover this section. All right, we'll go back to there now. But yeah, so object and related object, keep that in mind. Then you have object and classification. I don't know why I didn't cover that. So green, that's a color. Three, that's an odd number. A sandal is a type of shoe. This is very arguable. Not necessarily this is true, but yeah, a sandal is a type of shoe in the test, whatever. So an object and its classification, what is it, right? And they're going to put it in this form. And of course, you have to match it when you're choosing when you're choosing an answer. You have to match it. If you're given the classification first, choose a choice that has the classification first. If you're giving the object first, choose a, choose a choice that has the object first. Yeah. And now we're moving on. Object and its location. This is kind of tricky. 
but with memory and practice, you can remember it. Where does a car belong? Anywhere. You can say street. That is true. But street has animals and people and whatever, buildings. But a garage is made for a car. It can be used for other things, but it's made for a car. You get garages so that you put cars in them. So object and its location, most commonly found. A stove. Where do you find a stove in the house other than the kitchen? A lion. You find it a lot in the zoo or the jungle, but a zoo. You find lions in zoos. That's just, you know, its location. <laughs> so this this could be a little bit tricky, but yeah, just, just, just remember the type, that it's object and location. So whenever you see this, you're like, oh, yeah, this is object and location. I'm going to choose a choice that has an object first, location second, or location first, object second, depending on the question. And then you have object and part of the whole. This is a very, very common one. Everyone knows this for some reason. Hand and finger. So this is the part of whole. A finger is a part of the hand. A page is a part of the book. A year is a part of the month. You don't need to have it in the specific order. Maybe the test has it year and month, right? Just keep that in mind. I'm going to keep reminding you of it. I know it's annoying, but I will keep reminding you of it because... If you forget that, it could cause really unnecessary loss of grades. So don't forget that. They have to be the same. In order. All right. And then you have, lastly, object and function. What an object and what it's most commonly used for. So what do you use a pen for? Most commonly use it to write. You can use it to pick your nose or do whatever. But <laughs> right now we're thinking about what it's made for. A pen is made to write. A shovel is made to dig. A book is made to be read, or so book read. What do you do with a book? You read it. So, yeah, object and function. This is the, we're finally done, <laughs> the object and something section. This is it. Keep very, very, very important section. As you can see, it's a huge bulk of the types. So if you remember it, if you just memorize this for a bit, you're probably going to ace the section. We're going to move on to the next ones. We got performer and action. So the performer of the action. A teacher teaches. An artist paints. A bird flies. A person talks. Right? <laughs> it doesn't have to be in that order. But yeah, a performer and an action. Or an action and the performer. You can flip them around. Moving on, you got verb tenses. So a verb. An action and the tenses, so eat and then ate, right? You eat and past eight. Win, one, same thing, you know. You win, past for that is one. You buy, past for that is bought. So verb tenses. Whenever you see an action, it most, most, most of the time is probably going to be verb tenses type of analogy. Then you have cause and effect, also a very common one. Cause and effect. Very straightforward. You plant something, it will grow. You trip, you will fall. Or, you, or you know, you're describing what happened. I tripped and I fell. So trip, fall. I spin, now I'm dizzy. Spin dizzy. I get hit, now I'm hurt. You see? Cause and effect. And then you have problem and solution. I'm thirsty, this is my problem, so I drink. I am itchy, that's the problem, so I scratch. That's the solution. So problem and solution type of analogy. It gets more and more straightforward, as you can see. My favorite part, I have no idea why it's my favorite, but it is degree of characteristic. So something that is big compared to something that is enormous, right? Enormous, gigantic, huge. Something that is hot. This is my own word here. I, I use that. The book used a different word that didn't make sense to me. So something that is hot or something that is scorching, you know, very hot. These are extremities. So they're the same things. Do not confuse them with synonyms. Do not confuse them with synonyms. They are synonyms, but they are extremities. You see big and large, you're like, no, that's a synonym. But big and enormous, no, that's an extremity. Big is something big. Something that is enormous, like, damn, this is the side of a building, right? Enormous. Something that is hot compared to something that is scorching. Something that is small compared to something that is minuscule. It's an extremity of what being small is. An extreme version of that is to be minuscule. So don't, 
don't confuse it with the synonym. It's very easily confused, but if you have the other word, if the other word is just way more bulky and like fancy, you could say, or or just an extreme word, then you know that it's the degree of characteristics. Of course, they can be flipped around. If they are flipped around, make sure you choose the choice that has them flipped around as well. And by the way, if the word uh, minuscule is, uh, maybe you don't, you're not familiar with that, it just means something that is very small, microscopic. So now I want you to take the time to remember the types of analogies. Remember them. If you can memorize them, you're going to make your life a whole lot easier. If not, practice. And practice we will. First question, we have pedal and bicycle. So, how are you supposed to read this question? You're supposed to basically say, a pedal is to a bicycle. As what is to what? So, this means is to. Maybe this will help you while you're reading. So an inch is to a yardstick. Is that the same as a pedal and bicycle? You probably don't know what's a yardstick. We're not Americans, but whatever. Let's, let's move on. Tire automobile. Interesting. Interesting. Let's check out the other things. Walk ship. Walk not is in the sense of literally walking, right? Not in the sense as, I guess, this is me signaling that you are walking. Not in that sense. A walk is the walk of the ship, right? It's, it's a part of the ship, so it could be part to whole as well. And then you have oar and canoe. But what is the thing that is so close to pedal and bicycle? Right? Very close to it. That's what I want you to think about. All right? So you're going to see, hmm, tire automobile maybe, but a bicycle also uses a tire. A bicycle also has its own tire, right? So if if it was tire automobile, maybe maybe it would have been tire bicycle. You could replace this with tire as well. So maybe, but what does a what do you use a pedal for? It is to ride a bicycle. Do you, mo- you use the pedal to move the bicycle, right? And of course, this type of analogy is part to whole. And I can't see it. Um, yeah, object and part of a whole. A pedal is a part of a bicycle, right? And probably also, you know, it's not object and function because it's not telling you what we're doing here, but think about it in this way. Logicize. Use your brain a little bit while, while solving. Enjoy these questions, you know? Think of it as puzzles. Don't really think of it as, oh my god, this doesn't make any sense. Why does this person make this to torture me? Whatever, you know? You have to do this exam, so at least enjoy it. <laughs> Now, walk ship. I personally didn't know what a walk was, but then I realized it's a walk of a ship. So going on to the ship, there's this section of the ship that is called a walk, but it's not used to move the ship, is it? Not really. So we can disregard inch yardstick because it's just not part to hold. I don't know. Uh, You use a yardstick to measure an inch. So I don't know. I think so. I don't (laughs) know. I'm not American. Anyways, tire and automobile could be. So we're going to keep it as could be. A walk ship? Mm, not really. How about an oar and a canoe? A canoe is this weird little boat and it has oars. And you use the oars to move the right? canoe. So now you can see the resemblance. An oar really resembles a pedal. You can think of it, you you can even disregard the second part in this question. A pedal is used for the same function to move a bicycle as the oar. The oar is used to move the canoe. So, using that logic, tire and automobile goes out the window, sadly. That was my mistake, actually, during the exam. (laughs) But yeah, you get oar and canoe. Use some logic. You're going to be able to solve any question. Now, for question two... You have a division is to a section as what is to what. Division and section. Can you use these words interchangeably? 
can I say this is the English section? This is the English section, right? And I can also say this is the English division. For example, if we are in a school, right? I can say this is the English division or this is the English section. They are kind of used interchangeably. You can use them. They don't mean exactly the same thing, but you can use them interchangeably. What does that mean? They're synonyms. That's what it means. They are synonyms. So the second question, we have a synonyms. Now let's see what synonyms are here. You got layer and tier. You got tether and bundle. You got chapter, verse, riser, stage. Now you don't need to know every single word. You don't need to know what a riser is or what tether means, right? You just have to try it out. If you couldn't figure it out at all, then maybe you do have to know them. But for example, let's try the first thing, layer and tier. A tier, and I think you guys saw some of that, like top tier, um, let's say tier one, second tier, third tier, right? And you get layers. Don't these look like layers? <laughs> They're not specifically layers, you're not using them, you're not using them perfectly, you know, they're not identical. A layer is not in order and a tier is in order. So when I say top tier, that means it's better than second tier, better than third tier. So, yeah, but they're used interchangeably. I can, if I'm really in a hurry, I can be like, boom, that's it, done. A, layer tier. Or you can keep going, tether bundle. To tether something is to, let's say this is a rope and it's cut from this section, and you get another rope, it's cut from here, you tether it. So for example, you use a tool, or uh, you knit it together, and it becomes one. You've tethered it. Oh. Yeah, this is tether. You've tethered them together, just united them. Bundle. When things are bundled up together, right? So you got all of this mess, clattered everywhere, you bundle it, you bundle it up together, it's not exactly the same, you can't use it interchangeably, it's not close at all, right, you, I put things together, it's different than literally binding them together, you sh there shouldn't even be a difference here, they're, this, they're one thing, so tether bundle goes out the window, chapter verse has nothing to do with this, <laughs> right, they're not synonyms exactly, so yeah, riser stage, personally, I don't know what they mean by riser here. I know something, a riser is something that rises. What does it have to do with the stage? I don't know. Out the window. <laughs> Layer tier. Now, in no way, shape, or form is this a professional way to solve this exam. But also, in no way, shape, or form is this exam professional. <laughs> so, don't take it too seriously. Don't overthink it, is what I'm trying to tell you. My, my whole fault with this section of the exam, I overthought so much and... I used to get it wrong, then didn't, aced it completely, because I realized it's, it's a stupid section, it's honestly dumb, I mean, just look at it, right, if you can, if you know what the, what the words mean, that's it, you just have to put them together, so really don't overthink things, take, remember the, um, remember the word definitions, if you can, memorize some new words that you're gonna see for example for example these words bundle tether tier memorize them they're gonna be helpful in your life and also of course in the exam now we're gonna have to go a little bit faster so let's see depressed and sad now what does this remind you of being sad an extremity of it when you're really sad i'm so sad i feel depressed right it's an extremity so this is um, characteristic and degree, right? Uh, degree of characteristic, my favorite segment or section or division. Whoops. <laughs> I guess now you know the answer. <laughs> yeah, you get neat and considerate. You get towering and cringing. What does that even mean, right? What do these things have to do together? Neat, considerate. What, what are you talking about? Something that is neat is like something that is um, clean or like nice looking, it's, it's neat, it's very neat, considerate, someone who's considerate, someone who considers, or something that is considerate of the other things, right, 
you consider things. Um, rapid and plodding, I don't know what plodding means. Rapid is like fast, um, doing things quickly, rapidly. Then you get exhausted and tired. Simple as that. I struggled with to find a connection between this and this. I don't know what cringing has to do with towering. I don't know what plodding means. But I was like, wait a minute, exhausting, tired. When I am really tired, I am really exhausted. I am so sad, I'm depressed. I am really tired, man. I'm exhausted. They're the same thing. And that's why the answer is D. Now for question four, we've got bristle and brush. So a bristle is to a brush as what is to what, right? So bristles of a brush. Bristles are, let me draw a brush here. I'm going to try my best, okay? So, and they usually have this thing at the end. And bristles come out of it. Oh my God, what a horrendous brush. Let me try and just make it a bit more appealing. Yeah. These are the bristles of the brush. Bristles. So... Now that we know what a bristle is, we can tell that this is part to whole, right? A bristle is a type, is, is a part of the brush. So we get another part to whole. It is actually a fairly common um, type of analogy. We see that, we see it a lot. So let's see, arm and leg. An arm is not a part of a leg. <laughs> Maybe if this was arm body, would have been different, but yeah. Then you get stage curtain. A curtain is a part of the stage, but a stage is not part of the curtain. Huh, do you see? Told you, it's important and you didn't listen to me. Well, there it is. A bristle to a brush, stage curtain. If these were flipped, this would have been the choice. But if since they're not, you're not going to choose them. This is off. Then you get chair, recline and chair. Um, reclination of the chair they're not parts of each other. A chair can recline, which means go back, right? So let me let me even draw that as well. That's a chair, right? If it can go back and become, for example, like that, like straight up flat, or not necessarily straight up flat, like let's say part flat. It's reclined. Oh God, <laughs> it's it's reclined. Right? This is, if it can do that, that's not a part of it. So, no. Then you get key and piano. We don't mean key as in a literal key. Right? No, we mean key as in piano keys. When you have, if you play the piano, I'm going to offend you right now because I will draw the worst piano. And you get, oh, okay, I'm not going to even try. Okay? <laughs> but yeah, piano keys, the things that you actually click to play the piano. That's what a key is. It's a part of the piano. So, D. A key is a part of the piano. Bristle is part of a brush. That's it. Now we have odometer and distance. What is an odometer? And they didn't cover, I don't think they did, but maybe, maybe. Actually, object and function, maybe. I don't know. But I, don't, I couldn't relate it to any of the parts here, but it is actually a part. So you know, the measurement of something. It's actually a part, but I don't know why it's not included here uh, in the book. But it is a part. You gotta, you gotta know it. You know, the measuring, measuring distance, you use an odometer to measure whatever it is. You use whatever it is. You gotta know these things. And, I'm, and we're gonna see some examples, just like this one. So, an odometer is used to measure distance. If you drive a car, you already know that. Do you see the dash the little dashboard thing the numbers keep going up this is an odometer it measures the distance that the car has traveled all right so let's see first thing scale and weight and we're done <laughs> like a scale measures weight you use a scale to measure weight so there we go but let's see the other ones as well length and width you don't use length to measure width length is length of something i mean Length is length of something, and the width is the width of it. So, have nothing to do with each other. And then you get inch and foot. Have nothing to do with each other. They are just measurements, right? Mileage and speed. 
a mileage does not measure speed. <laughs> so we're only left with scale and weight. Now you have waitress and restaurant. A waitress works at a restaurant, right? The waitress that comes, greets you, what would you like to eat, gives you the menu, all of that stuff. She works at a restaurant. All right, so let's see. So this could go with um, which one of these? Let's see. Probably object and location. She's not an object, but or performer in action, maybe. No, actually, it doesn't work here. Never mind. <laughs> but you could say object and location, but it's you're going to find it a lot more common of the profession and location, right? So a teacher, school, or like, Maybe it's a part here, but I, I don't know. I forgot it. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, you're maybe going to find it. A uh, teacher in a school or a doctor in a hospital, you're going to find a lot of these questions, right? So waitress restaurant, you get doctor diagnosis. No, because a doctor does not work in a diagnosis. He diagnoses. He looks at you as like, oh, your throat is hurting and your arms are red. You got cancer. Other a lot, whatever, <laughs> right? And then you have actor and role. An actor plays a role. They don't work in a role. A driver works in a truck. Maybe, right? A driver, they drive a truck. Don't necessarily work in it. But okay, keep that. Uh, so, you know, keep that. We, we've taken apart these two, but okay, interesting. And then you get teacher in school. Very straightforward. A waitress in a restaurant, a teacher works at a school, a driver could be driving a car, not a truck. Could be you could look at pilots as drivers, they drive planes, right? But a teacher, they work at a school. Maybe now it's changing because of the internet, they can work from home. But yeah, a teacher, they practice their profession at school. So our answer is going to be D. As you can see, we are using... The analogies, what we know of them, the rules, or not the rules, the types of them. But we're also using common sense and logic. The exam is testing your ability to have common sense and logic. So, can, can this thing change within you? Can you make it better? Of course you can. Not, not exponentially. You're not going to completely change and become look at the world in an entirely different way. But... This is one way of it to make it easier for you. You practice the test. You see what the test wants and you're going to be able to get it. You're, you're going to understand the format of the exam and everything else will be easy, hopefully. For number seven, we have skein and yarn. Now, what is skein, right? Maybe you know what a yarn is. And a yarn is this thread that you use to knit stuff, you know, the knitting needles let's say these are knitting needles let's pretend right <laughs> and you get a yarn it's made out of wool sometimes maybe not and you're using it and you're knitting something you make it into a t-shirt right the threads used are the yarn. I get, I hope I paint a clear image. I don't know. But yeah, so a yarn. And it usually looks like this. It's placed on something and it's like going back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Excuse me for that. Let's make it messy. Okay. It has like a circle at the end. It goes like that. Right, and it looks like that, and then you, when you pull it, it, you get a long string. That's a yarn, and this thing is a skein. Right, I just made sure how to spell it. <laughs> this thing is a skein, and then so yeah, that's a skein and a yarn. So a yarn is usually twirled around the skein. You twirl it, twirl it, twirl it. You get it one clump of a yarn. Right. This is a skein. So let's see the choices. You get squeeze and lemon. Nothing to do with yarn and skein, right? You squeeze the lemon. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> Fire coal. Again, nothing to do with skein and yarn. 
you don't see, I, I personally don't see any resemblance, right? And that's the thing, you have to think of it like that. Don't, don't overthink, wait, fire and coal. So the fire is caused by the coal and the skin, maybe it's also caused by, no, just it isn't. <laughs> it's not even, no. Then you get ream and paper. So when a bunch of paper, like a lot, a lot of paper, um, it's put together. I don't need to draw what paper is. I don't know why I started drawing. When a lot of paper is put together, you get this stack of paper, right? And it's like lines, lines, lines everywhere. And it's like paper, 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 paper. Yeah, that's that's a ream of paper. This is very much resembling of a skein, isn't it? When you get a yarn is like really twirled around each other and you, uh, or around itself actually and it's like one big clump it's a skein all right what about one big clump of paper a ream of paper it's almost the same thing so i personally just go ahead choose ream but let's see the last thing tree and lumber really not not much in common but also they are flipped you get skein and yarn. You get the material on the second side, but here you have the material on the first side. So it doesn't work. And that's why you get 7C, ream and paper. If anyone has a better explanation, leave it in the comments. I'll be checking it out. Or if you have any questions. But yeah, this was one of the more difficult questions. It's a bit unclear. It doesn't follow an exact pattern. But the answer is ream and paper by just using, you know, logic, well, oh, so, but, like, when you get a lot of yarn twirled together, oh, that's a skein, all right, when you get a bunch of paper put together, oh, that's a ream, it even rhymes, all right, moving on to number eight, we get slapstick is to laughter, as what is to what, so slapstick, have you ever heard of slapstick, slapstick comedy, it's a, it's a genre of comedy, it causes laughter, right, it's associated with laughter. When you're watching a slapstick comedy, you're expected to laugh. With that in mind, we can start solving the question. You get fallacy and dismay. A fallacy is something that is false, right? You, or, or wrong also, right? A fallacy, you've committed a fallacy. A fraud, wrong. And dismay. Dismay is being, you know, it's like saying, may I? So... Is it may? Is it okay, basically? This may? It's not okay. I'm feeling this may. I'm angry. I'm not happy. I'm unhappy, not angry. But yeah, I'm, feel I'm, I'm feeling this may. I'm not happy. Nothing to do with slapstick and comedy. Nothing to do with a genre and how it's supposed to make you feel. This, this goes with associations. Slapstick is associated with laughter. So it goes back to our um, part here of things that go together. Slapstick goes together with laughter. So, yeah, we can keep solving now. So, genre, mystery. Mystery is a genre, right? But, again, nothing have, nothing that have to do with each other. Laughter is not a genre of... Laughter is not a genre. <laughs> or, laughter is not slapstick. So, yeah, they don't work. This one doesn't work. Satire and anger. It's close, right? Sa slapstick and laughter. So satire. Satire is something that is satirical, something that is ironic. It's like you're like, wow, what, you know, this is ironic, right? But not necessarily causes anger. It doesn't necessarily lead to anger. Some people, it can lead them to laugh or something else, right? So let's keep it, but maybe it's not really our answer. I'm going I'm to I'm choose this symbol instead. Then you have horror and fear. Uh-huh, now you see it. Horror causes fear. Fear is usually, so when, when you watch a horror movie, you're expected to be afraid, right? You're expected to feel horror. And I guess that's where it, that's where you guys can see it. Slapstick laughter, horror, comedy. <laughs> God, <laughs> horror, fear. <laughs> now for question nine, we have verve and enthusiasm. All right, now verve is to enthusiasm as what is to what. Verve is almost a synonym to enthusiasm. I'm not sure if it's an extremity or not, but 
I know that it's a, a synonym. So when you're really enthusiastic about something, you're excited about it. You have verve, right? You're, it's vervacity. <laughs> verve, you're, you're excited for it. So yeah, verve. And using that information, it's very basic information. As you can see, for example, take my example. I don't know what it necessarily means, but let's see what it necessarily means to enthusiasm. I don't know if it's an extremity or not, but we can test the waters by checking the answer choices. We have loyalty and duplicity. I don't know what duplicity means. I know what loyalty is, right? So I'll just leave it at that. You get devotion and reverence. Now that I know, when you're really devoted to something, you also have reverence for it. I'm, I'm devoted for it. I'm, Yeah, you have reverence for it. It's also almost a synonym. So I'm going to keep that in mind because this sounds a bit close. Intensity and color. Yeah, not it's not really, no, not really the same thing, right? Not really going well with it. So I'll take that away. <laughs> then you have imminence and anonymity. So imminence, something that is imminent, it's bound to happen. 100% will happen. It has, it's imminent to happen, right? So that is imminence, the thing that will happen. It's imminent. It's bound to happen and bound to occur. And then you have anonymity, which is being anonymous maybe i'm getting it wrong maybe but let's say right now i'm using my brain as someone who's actually doing the test i haven't seen this question before but okay i'm doing the test right now let's see what what am i gonna do i don't know what most of these words mean but i know verve and enthusiasm and devotion and reverence sound really close intensity and color is out of the window duplicity and loyalty i don't know what duplicity means but i know that what loyalty means I don't think this duplicity is a synonym for loyalty. I don't think so. It doesn't sound like it. Duplicity, it sounds like duplicate. It's maybe something that has to do with duplication. It has to do with something else away from loyalty, right? So, in my logic, I'll take it out. I don't have any other choice, right? I, that's what I have to do. I'm going to take it out. I'm, I'm going to have to solve this question. I'm going to have to manage. I have time, right? So, I'm thinking, I'm thinking quickly. Eminence and anonymity. So using my knowledge, something imminent is something that is imminent. Maybe it's something else. Maybe this word has a double meaning, right? Maybe it doesn't mean what I think it means. But also same thing with anonymity. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is the answer. But, but using my logic, using my common sense, I can see that this is way more of a synonym to this. And why am I saying way more than a of a synonym? Because verb and enthusiasm, they're not extremes of each other. They're synonyms. Imminence and anonymity could also be synonyms, but we don't know. But we do know devotion and reverence. So we go with what we know. That's how, how you could solve this test. You don't have to be 100%. And devotion and reverence is correct, actually. That's the correct answer. Yeah, it is the correct answer. <laughs> and imminence and anonymity isn't. But even though I don't know what it means, I'm left with two choices, right? Even though if you got it wrong, okay? Let's say let's say you took these two out, right? It's it's way better to have a 50-50 chance. Even if you're going to guess <clears throat> even if you're going to guess at this point, if okay, so I don't know if it's devotion, reverence or imminence or anonymity, but at least we we did the process of elimination. We, we have a 50% chance of getting the right question, of getting the right um, answer. So that's way better than a 25% chance, right? So take a chance, but use as much logic, like squeeze your brain as much as possible just to get down to the last two choices. If you can get three, if you can just eliminate one choice, do as much as you can. Just get as close as you can to the answer and then just throw it. You're not going to lose grades for guessing, are you? No, you're not. So go ahead, guess. I am personally guessing devotion, reverence. Lo and behold, I am rewarded for my guess and for doing this process with getting the right answer. Now, final question number 10. We get spy and clandestine. All right, let's solve. What is a spy? I think we all know what a spy is. It's someone secretive, does secret missions, right? Um, listens, uh, or, or yeah, you plant a spy to listen from the enemy, or listen to the enemy, hear the enemy, know what they're planning, know what they're saying. A spy. And clandestine. Now, you 
maybe you don't know what clandestine is, so this is very instructive. Clandestine is being very secretive and sneaky and being very spy-ish. <laughs> it's being clandestine. That's what a spy is being. They're being very clandestine. So using that information, we can now start solving. We have accountant and meticulous. An accountant, right? They, they, they're they a financial advisor maybe or whatever, but they're an accountant. You know, they're doing with, they're dealing with money. They're dealing with very specific amounts or prices and things like that, right? So they're going to be meticulous. That's a characteristic that goes with accountants. They are meticulous people. And then you get, so we keep that in mind, right? Because it kind of sounds the same already, meticulous and clandestine. It's, they're both characteristics of this profession, of being an accountant. You, most of them, they're meticulous. Being a spy, they're clandestine. So we keep that in mind. Then you have furrier and rambunctious, or rambunctious. I think I, yeah, yeah, this is definitely OU. Yeah, rambunctious. A furrier is someone who sells fur. And rambunctious is also characteristic, but doesn't necessarily describe a furrier. And then, so, yeah, if, if this, this, this still sounds better to me. So, let's just keep it, right? Lawyer ironic. Now, a lawyer, that's also a profession, so that's good, because it's starting with a profession. But ironic, that's not really a, a characteristic that goes with every lawyer, right? They don't have to be ironic, and it's not very necessarily they're ironic, so... Maybe you can take that out the window. And we have shepherd and garrulous. So shepherd, someone who takes care of cattle or sh actually someone who takes care of sheep. And yeah, that's a shepherd. And garrulous. Garrulous means like annoyingly talkative. <laughs> Something was garrulous, right? Shepherds could be garrulous. They could be, maybe you meet a shepherd who's really annoyingly talkative, but it's not really, they're not necessarily talkative people. If you, if someone knows, oh, you're a shepherd, oh, that means you're really talkative. No, not necessarily. You're, doesn't, oh, you're garrulous. Not necessarily, right? Or not, you're, oh, so you're very annoying and stuff. Not necessarily, right? So we're going to take that out as well. As you can see, these were very close choices, tough choices, but we have eliminated two. Now we have a 50% chance of choosing the right one. And since I've already said that accountant and meticulous sounds way better to me than furrier and rambunctious, I don't see the relation in furrier and rambunctious as much as I do with accountant and meticulous. In relation to spy and clandestine, I will go with A. And it is the correct answer. 10 A. Spy, clandestine, accountant, meticulous. And we have reached the end of our video. If you made it through the entire thing, I truly, from depths of my heart, wish you good luck. And I know this wasn't really a very professional um, teaching session. You didn't really come out with rules and specific things to use, but you can probably get those from your teacher. I am mostly here to solve questions, show you what they look like, but also... I'm a student. I'm trying to show you what a student thinks like. I don't know most of them, not most of them, but I don't know some of the words that we're using. A lot of them, I don't know them, right? So what do you do when you don't know the words? The teacher's not going to tell you what to do when you don't know them. They're going to teach you the words. I, I'm telling you, not a, you know, some words come, no one, that come in the exam and no one expected them to be there. That happened to me. I was doing the test. I'm like, what the hell does this word mean? But using the methods which I've used with you today, the way to simplify the answers. Your goal is always to simplify. Your goal is always to make things easier for you. And of course, using the, some of the rules that we've covered, for example, the types of analogies, and also knowing that it has to be in order as well, these things are really going to help you. This section is not hard, and we've had some, in, we've, I've chosen some interesting examples. I've chosen some really easy ones, some really tough ones and ones in the middle and things like that. You're going to see a lot of each in a test, in a GAT test. So hopefully, I really hope this was a very um, instructive uh, video for you. I hope that you've learned something from it. And if you have, then please pray for me. And if you have any questions, please ask. I'm always available. I will link, I will put a, I will put my, my email in the description and you can just leave a comment if you 
don't really want to email, that's completely fine by me. I'm going to reply to all comments. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. <laughs> I apologize for the terrible drawing. <laughs> and I will see you on the next one. Allahi wa fikkum jamian.